So my name is Dr. Bassey. I'm an addiction psychiatrist. I live in Chicago and I use Zoom along with Charm in order to see my patients who are primarily telepsychiatric patients. So I do exclusively virtual visits and my patients are actually located in their homes or sometimes at work, in fact. Um, and you know, I take I take insur commercial insurance, so I also use the billing portion of Zoom. I mean, of Charm, and it actually is quite useful in that uh, Charm has basically every aspect of I, of what I need in order to practice medicine. Um, and so I have a presentation here that I'll start off with, and these are just a few PDFs that I can run through that I thought would be valuable because I gave this. I gave this presentation to some psychologists um, in regard to how to how to do um, virtual visits with patients because everybody is really interested in that and um, doesn't you know there's a lot of frequently asked questions and I, so I thought I would address these with this um, with this presentation but I'll go over a couple useful slides and how they relate to charm and when I was for uh, back about two years ago when I first started looking at which um, platform to use and I was Evaluate, working with Venki and evaluating various platforms, um, I I looked at a number of uh, a number of companies, and you can see them listed here. And it took me a while to get a sense of what's out there because there's various combinations of things, and they all um, re, you know require to set up a demonstration, and it's very time intensive. Um, but you know one thing. One reason that I, I ended up looking at or going with Charm, which was ended, ended up being the 20th out of total of 31 different companies uh, that I had been looking at, it incorporated the HR, which is obviously the most important component. And then it also had the secure patient portal, which, um, as we know, email is not secure, so the patients can use this and to communicate back and forth to me and my other staff. And um, I have <clears throat> three therapists and a PA who work with me. So we can all communicate amongst each other and with the patient through this secure portal. And then it also incorporates electronic prescribing, which I'll show a little bit of, and then um, basically printing requisition forms for lab ordering and getting the results back. And then also uh, scheduling among different providers who are in different time zones. So that component can be um, somewhat, you know, somewhat difficult and challenging, but it, it incorporates it pretty well in Charm. And then it also includes Zoom, which is what you see up here in, in the screen, which I am actually currently um, in. Um, so my <clears throat> my webcam is actually right above this screen here. So what I do is I try to. Uh, like maneuver the windows on my laptop on my screen on my laptop so that the charm EHR is as close as possible to the camera itself and the the zoom window is also close to, as possible to the camera and so that way it kind of approximates um, eye contact with the patient and so it's not like I'm looking over to the side when I'm typing my note everything looks like I'm you know relatively speaking looking directly at the patient. And so <clears throat> I looked at a few different different setups, but this Logitech uh, camera actually was pretty high quality. <clears throat> and I won't go into all the, the technical details of what the ATA recommends and what the insurance companies recommend, but um, this fit the bill with the Logitech camera and it had a wide, wide field of vision so that patients can kind of feel like they're in an uh, actual appointment with me. Um, <clears throat> I don't use headphones. I hadn't had this is issue with an echo, but my patients sometimes, you know, need to use headphones because on their end, they do have an echo. And then um, it's just some general pointers. Uh, won't go into all the specifics, but, you know, generally speaking, have frontward facing lighting. Um, so I have a lamp in front of me, a lamp behind me, and sometimes I need to close the curtains in the, in the daytime. And I mentioned this about um, positioning the camera as close as possible to approximate direct eye contact. And so for now, I will go into 
go into charm here. And so I really like it because it is web based. And so if, you know, something happened to this computer, I can easily switch over to the next computer. And um, that was another component of a, of a platform that I was looking for is it something that was web based and had a, you know, a cloud where all the data was saved to it. And so this is just a dummy patient. And so um, <clears throat> I actually recommend providers to test out what it looks like on the, the PHR, the patient health portal. Um, so I log into the dummy patient every once in a while just to um, visualize what the patients are seeing on their end because sometimes they might have questions like, how did I check into the appointment and whatnot? And so it, it's a lot easier for me or my assistant to describe to them how to navigate into CHARM, the PHR, and uh, log into the appointment because invariably patients will have some questions about that. And so after my assistant speaks to the patient over the phone and gets some demographic information like their name, date of birth, which are required for insurance billing purposes and their address <clears throat> and their home phone number, um, I also send an invitation to them uh, to their email so that they can create an account in CHARM through the portal. And um, that's, there's a lot more flexibility here for customization. Um, but I, I don't use all of these categories, but I can see how maybe other practices might. Um, and I also do have the, the notifications turned on. So they do get email notifications, text reminders, and voice notifications, which are um, very affordable, I think, in terms of uh, the economics, the, the cost benefit analysis, because if a patient you know, misses an appointment, you're losing hundreds of dollars and it's only a few tens of dollars to get notifications sent to them. Um, and so that, that is <clears throat> inputted. And then also <clears throat> I have any sort of like documents that like insurance information, their, their license, it's not in this dummy patient, but I would have those imported into the documents tab as well. And so, um, my, so, you know, if I went in back into the main screen for charm, it would show that you know, it would show all of my providers' views and all the patient information. So I won't click there right now, but um, it, that's probably the main way that I open up the patient's chart. And so the patient's chart is already open now. I would see a prior history of all their previous appointments that I have tested out. I think every time I onboarded a, a therapist, I made a new encounter and I walked them through how to how to, how to do a, an encounter. And so that's why there are so many appointments with this dummy patient. And so I'll, what I would do is go into encounters, um, create a new encounter. There's already one open. So it's going to tell me, you know, there's one open. Do you want to continue this? And so, yes, I'll continue this one. And, and um, I use the comprehensive version of the note. A couple of therapists that I work with use just the, the simple version, but I like the comprehensive one because it, it uses rich text. And so I use um, bolding features uh, to indicate positive for my review of systems. And so that's why I like the, the comprehensive note and it kind of breaks it down a little bit better visually for me to, to, um, to navigate to different parts of the, the note. And so what I use is the history mainly, and I just put my chief complaint in this history and I, have a various quick texts. Um, so if I do dot intro, it basically picks up this quick text that I had made to start my encounter. And so this is a template um, within the settings that you can customize there and uh, start typing away. And same with the next sections, I use the past medical history, family and social history. Um, <clears throat> and then the review of systems, and I also have my mental status exam here. Um, I have an assessment, and then um, when I want to make a diagnosis for this patient, I would I actually made a number of templates so that we can keep things um, somewhat standardized among various providers in the practice. And so I have templates by category, um, ADHD, anxiety, diagnoses, bipolar diagnoses, depression, um, various lab diagnoses for when you're, you're creating a, an, a requisition form for a lab uh, draw. 
and then I would enter enter a diagnosis, um, <clears throat> uh, make a you know enter a prescription. So I do add RX and say Zoloft, and then very easily see a uh, drop down of all the results of everything that matches Zoloft, including the brand name and the, the generic. And so that's pretty easy. I usually just cl click on the brand name because there's an option in here to say um, uh, substitution is always allowed by default. And so I don't change that. And so they can always um, fill the generic if they want to. And so enter my instructions, add and sign, and then uh, easily transmit that over to their pharmacy uh, by ERX, which is really nice. And I have the controlled substances set up um, so that I would do dual authentication if required. And then uh, enter my treatment plan. Um, and then for in, in terms of a CPT code, I also have um, those that would automatically populate. So you can just enter whatever billing code you have here. And then I use, since I'm always doing telehealth, I use the GT modifier. Um, and then I would do diagnosis and link that with the diagnosis. And, um, and then that would be about it. Uh, let me see here. Oh, since, oh yeah. And then in order to start the tele, I should have probably mentioned this at the beginning, but this little green video consult icon is what I would click in order to connect to the patient via Zoom. And so the patient would go to their PHR and click check in uh, as long as it's within a 30 minute time frame of the appointment. And then their, their Zoom application would open up and I would just reframe or reposition Zoom on my desktop so it's as close as possible to the camera. And then basically this is exactly um, what I would be, I'll minimize this. And so this is exactly what I would be seeing um, my picture would be up here and then the, the patient's screen would be about like right beneath my, my photo. And so um, I would be typing and looking at the camera and typing uh, while I'm in the note and also looking at the patient um, right here. So everything is kind of all in the same field of view. Um, yeah, and so that is about it. And so uh, <clears throat> Zoom also has a number of features of sharing screen and, and chatting with the patient if there's any sort of technical difficulties. Sometimes um, the audio is probably, and it's probably just user error, the audio for the, on the patient side, they're sometimes muted, or if the, the patient has a poor internet connection, um, their audio may cut out. And so I might use the telephone in conjunction with the video camera in order to uh, fulfill that, that role when the audio cuts out, I just call them on the phone and keep the video camera running. That way we can you know, continue onward with the visit and have it not be a hindrance to the, the visit. And so, um, so once I sign the encounter, um, <clears throat> my assistant Rebecca would essentially go into this and she would see this here and generate a new invoice and choose whichever insurance company that they had and that would that would be an eligible drop down if there was insurance for this dummy patient and then she would enter the charge click approve <clears throat> and then what we would do is we would send the invoice we send it both to their phr and we also send it to their email address and i had customized this here so the patients can get a better sense of how to pay me and uh, they usually pay, end up paying by credit card so that's really nice that it's incorporated in with bluefin and then the patients get that on their end and then we end up uh, generating a claim with this button down here so that was um, generate claim under that invoice and so this is blank because they don't have insurance and then we basically work through the claim and submit it um, and so, yeah, that, it all basically incorporates everything. Once the, the claim gets evaluated, the 
um, electronic remittance advice will come back to us and we'll be able to see um, basically the amount that the, the insurance company paid and the amount that's remaining on the balance and we're able to reconcile the differences in there and, and just reach out to the patient for whenever you know, there's, there's a balance due. So very nice that the ERAs come back automatically um, with a number of different insurance providers. I take about 10 different insurance providers and so that all gets incorporated through Optum um, and ends up getting connected into to Charm and it works pretty seamlessly in that regard. Um, so yeah, and then you know, I use the messages uh, section here to communicate with the patient. I use the encounter section, as I mentioned, appointments section to see when they've seen my other therapists. I use the documents section. Um, I use the medication section when the pharmacy calls me to see, you know, what's what re, you know number of refills are remaining on people's uh, medications. I use the allergies section. I usually just ask the patient over the the Zoom encounter what their recent height and weight is and just enter that manually what their recent blood pressure is because they have blood pressure stations at pharmacies. So they can end up just giving me that directly. And then I can make uh, lab orders if I wanted to do lab order. I can go to lab plus lab order, click templates. <clears throat> I'll make this a little wider. And then if I wanted to just get a hemoglobin A1C, comprehensive metabolic panel and a CBC, I would add that and then map it to the diagnosis that they have so that when they print, print the requisition form, it will actually show so that when they go to Quest or go to LabCorp, they can enter that in for the insurance billing purposes. And so then I would share that to patient. Um, and there's usually a way, probably, it, when you're in the encounter, there's a way to share it to the patient, or you can say, you know, lipid panel uh, must be fasting, or like whatever you need to say to the patient, and then you can save it and then um, <clears throat> share it to patient right here, and it says yes, okay. Or if they're not getting it for some reason, or if the, I had one patient call me while they're at the lab itself, and so they needed the PDF to be sent so that the lab can, you know, figure out what my MPI number is and all of that good stuff. So I exported it as a PDF and just ended up emailing it to the patient directly. So that's nice that it has that feature there. Um, <clears throat> and so diagnoses, I use that tab as well. Um, referrals, I put this in once before as a referral out. It's not one that I use often, but it's a nice feature if I were to Know, send uh, patients to therapists, but I have therapists who work in my office, so I don't use it all too often. Um, and then quick notes, I sometimes use if a patient calls and I just don't want to make an encounter, so I just put a, a jot something in that I spoke to the patient and we discussed you know, going up on the, on the medication uh, so that next time I see them, I can remember what we talked about. And there's also a sticky note that I could put here and jot that in as well. Um, <clears throat> And so that's, that's about it with that side here. And then I mentioned the sticky notes. Tasks we sometimes use to assign tasks to my assistant. And then um, to enter a card to store on file. Um, since they can't swipe it in, since I'm not in person, I usually end up just doing key in and then entering their billing information. And so that is it. I can take some questions in person now. Thank you so much, Dr. Bassey. I think that was really a wonderful um, overview of how telehealth works within Charm Health. Um, and I see some of you have asked questions on, uh, in the Q&A. Feel free to go ahead and ask your questions there. Um, uh, really quickly, I, I just noticed uh, just three people that I, I saw that were there at the Charm Lot conference. I just wanted to say hi, Dr. Uh, Dr. Alvarez, uh, Dr. Gradia, and uh, Peggy Stein. Just say hi if you're there. Wanted to just reach out. And of course, Dr. Bassi was there as well. So, yeah. um, 
So just a quick note about that trauma lot will be the end of uh, December this year. It'll be the first week of December, just uh, so you guys can pencil that in. Um, so Dr. Bassey, um, when we, when many of these attendees are registering, registered, um, uh, they uh, had a lot of questions on regarding um, the legalities around telemedicine, uh, regarding reimbursement, the state to state differences. Um, could you comment a little bit about that? Um, I guess um, telehealth is, uh, until telehealth is considered a mode of care as opposed to a separate, a separate type of service, I guess we're gonna see um, differences in how it's billed and reimbursed. But could you go a little bit into that or provide point us to some resources? Sure, there's a lot of resources out there um, and they can be pretty difficult to sift through when you're going through it for the first time. So I always recommend uh, getting guidance from either a malpractice. Um, and I'm getting a little echo back, I think, Ranjani, from if you can just lower the, the volume um, coming out of your speakers there. That's one of the reasons why sometimes I recommend people using headphones. Oh, there, it's perfect. Um, it reduces that. But yeah, regardless, um, so talking to a healthcare lawyer um, who may be able to guide you and also your malpractice company too. They uh, were able to help me to uh, figure out the state specific laws. And one of the other rules of thumb that I have is just to start in your own state because they can be drastically different from state to state regarding the telehealth reimbursement laws. And so I do actually have a resource and I will share my desktop now. So this is a nonprofit called Center for Connected Health Policy and they have a, a PDF that was compiled in the fall of 2019. Now that's part of as uh, darn updated as you can get because these things are constantly um, you know, changing laws. So uh, Ranjani will send out the link to this um, and you can look up your state. Let's say for instance, um, well, this is a really nice table here. So it, it basically has a nice table that, that puts it all together. And then if you go down further, um, it actually tells you what the statutes stated specifically regard to the definition and reimbursement. And so that's, that's one good resource, and Ranjani was on the link to that. And then also, I think I saw somebody who asked a question about this regarding the, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the modifier code, so the GT modifier code, and what does that mean? So this is another uh, PDF that was put together by the same uh, nonprofit system. This is called Billing for Telehealth Encounters in January 2020, so it's pretty up to date. And you can see this uh, table of contents here it basically goes through all of that stuff, all your um, most frequently asked questions in regard to that. And so, um, and then the third resource that I have is that I, I had done a video in regard to the clinical challenges of doing telehealth. So I didn't want to overload um, people in this webinar. I wanted to keep it more charm specific and talking about how the interface is with, with Charm specifically. So I didn't go into some of the technical challenges, how to troubleshoot them, some of the requirements that, were, that are required by the insurance companies and by law, and um, other sorts of clinical challenges like how to do an AIMS test, for example, when the individual's in their house and you, you can't actually see their knees and kind of coaching them through, through that sort of thing. Wonderful. Um, there may be other questions coming in, but while they do come in, um, one of the questions that came in through registration was um, some of the nuances and the challenges of telehealth. Um, and I think um, you've, you have another YouTube that I, um, as I was researching about you, you had another YouTube that is quite interesting it's as, as well. Um, you speak a little bit about, you know, different challenges of telehealth um, and you speak about, okay, patients that have an emergency or, um, you know, have substance abuse as a challenge um, or met metabolic syndrome and how do you deal with these challenges and could you point us to a resource? I'm pulling it up now. Okay. Yeah, so it's a 50 minute the other side. Uh, lecture that I gave. Okay, so let me do a screen share again and so this is um, so this is a video I gave basically of all the clinical aspects regarding telehealth. Um, 
specifically relating to psychiatry and psychology and therapy. And so here is basically the table of contents. Um, and it, you can click on these blue hyperlinks to jump to them. So I, I go over all of the technology, uh, guidelines regarding video bandwidth, HIPAA issues, standard of care and how that's defined, prescribing considerations, billing considerations, appropriateness and how to uh, make sure that they don't need a higher level of care and that telehealth is actually appropriate level of care for them. Um, emphasizing certain communication styles while doing telehealth visits, uh, common technical issues that you might run into and, and uh, backup options that you might want to have available to you and your providers, uh, other providers, so that they know if there's any sort of glitch or there's any sort of user error that you can't figure out how to log in, there's some sort of backup contingency plan, how to deal with emergencies in regard to suicidal ideation, how do you would handle that and what my protocol is, and then some, some diagnostic limitations and shortcomings of telepsychiatry. Um, the challenges. So, um, yeah, hopefully that would be helpful for people. Uh, Dr. Bassi, I see a question here. Um, someone's asked the name of the third resource. Um, we can definitely mail, or I will send it across um, to all of the registrants and the attendees, uh, all the three resources. Um, two of them were for the Center of uh, Connected Health Policy, one's on the billing, another one's on insurance. And um, the final one is uh, regarding um, Dr. Bassi's telehealth, tel telepsych health. Um, it's a YouTube video, a little bit more in-depth coverage than just telehealth itself. Um, I see a question here. Do you notice uh, a difference in the level of patient comfort and the sense of safety when doing telehealth versus in-person visits? Sense of safety. Um, definitely, there's a difference among patient population among uh, uh, regarding the level of comfort with telehealth, and and it it uh, ranges the entire gamut. Uh, when people call us and we tell them that we're a telehealth only company, um, there is the immediate. Well, I'm not interested in that, and that's probably on the far end of the spectrum of people who aren't interested, they know that they're not tech, tech savvy and they have no interest in becoming tech savvy. And then there's people who are interested in it, never tried it before, may need some coaching. And so I have a, a webpage that I refer them to that I basically had covered all of the, the general guidelines of how to optimize the session. Um, and then there are individuals who are tech savvy but may run into some issues, uh, understandably, with just like, their their connectivity, their internet speed, uh, their camera, or their um, or their microphone. So let me pull up how to ensure a good telepsych visit. So I will do a screen share again of this website on my webpage. So I, this is what I send my patients to. Um, so it's it's basically just guidelines, choosing the appropriate setting because people tried to make an appointment with me and they're driving their car and pulling off over the side of the road. And so <laughs> it's kind of obvious to you and I, but I just make that even more obvious to not maybe uh, set an appointment while you're driving, choosing a laptop that is uh, fairly new and not old and <laughs> has a good camera. And um, we recommend headphones to reduce any sort of echo and also like the mic microphone cuts out when the other individual speaks. And so it, it could be hard. It's a lot easier to ha have a back and forth conversation more quickly with headphones in my experience. And then we talk a little bit about the internet um, getting the private area. And so uh, I talk about how to install Zoom on your device. Uh, it should load automatically once you click on the session for the first time. But if you want to practice and make sure all the make sure Zoom is loaded properly and things are working okay. You know, I recommend that people do it beforehand. Checking your internet speed and how to do that, I recommend at least 10 megabytes per second. Um, testing out Zoom. Um, and, and then video tips, like maximizing front-facing lighting, minimizing lighting behind you. And then uh, some audio tips too, and then logging into the appointment. And so- Practical, practical <clears throat> tips. 
-hmm. Yeah. I mean, people otherwise were wondering, and that probably plays out in a lot of anxiety in joining the session. So uh, I thought it would be useful to just kind of get that down and, and not repeat myself and because it's, it is very helpful to people. Um, for all the attendees here, um, telehealth, adding telehealth onto um, your practice is $20 a month. I don't know if any of you had questions regarding um, how to do that, but it would be on the settings under add-ons and you would activate it. If anybody really needed to know how to do that, I could also send a link regarding um, where that is. Uh, the, but it, um, we have a resource in our website. We have a resource area that shows how to get there, or else we could do a quick demo right now. Um, yeah, um, I have that pulled up too, actually. So sure. here's the the front page of my screen, um, and then it would be this one here. It's down in this little plug looking mm -hmm. icon, and it says add-ons. Sure. Then you go over there and it's the second one down on the left here called telehealth and you click yes. that and then you would just. Perfect. Yes, that's exactly it. what I want. It's, it's that simple just to go ahead and add it on. And then you'll be, you're, you receive an invoice and then you'll get the 20% off uh, if you sign up before April 15th. So um, that's um, something for you guys to think about if you want to start telehealth. Um, right now um, is telehealth HIPAA compliant yes it is very much so um, is oh, it's per, per provider yeah yes it's per provider yeah. and then as yeah. charm telehealth smartphone compatible as more most patients use smartphones these days yes very much so um, yeah there's an app um, there's a zoom app for Android and iPhone um, yeah it works Works pretty well. Oh, it's maybe pull. Yes, perfect. Yeah, we can see it. Join the meeting. Great. Yeah. So wonderful. Um, I think I see one more question, and we'll just take this last question, uh, and then maybe we will continue. Um, so once you add, um, add, once you add on telehealth charm, is are all the is all of the integration with Zoom automatic, or does the practice need a separate account with Zoom? Practice doesn't need a separate account with Zoom. Right, so it's it's automatic. Um, it loads automatically. Does Charm okay. use a third-party vendor for scheduling? No, it's all within. Charm right. is fully integrated. That's the best part. Charm has all the bells and whistles of larger EHR companies. So the advantage of using Zoom through Charm is that um, when you're in an encounter, you can easily just open up the same room for the patient and yourself to get into. Um, so there are, there's plenty of, of um, telehealth services out there that you can have like a virtual waiting room and have the patients when they log into the waiting room, they can't see who else is in the waiting room. Um, it's, I, th I like Zoom and I go into why I think Zoom is probably one of the best services out there because not, not all of them encrypt and compress the data the same. And so if somebody has a, a semi questionable internet connection, some of the services might just cut out. And I, I think Zoom being such a large company, they actually do a very good job at, at encrypting mm -hmm. and compressing and sending and transmitting the data than other ones do. The integration of EP, electronic prescribing, can you speak briefly on integrating the electronic prescribing? I, it was just as simple as the um, adding the RX entering your instructions and then transmitting it, signing it and transmitting it. And it's actually 10 times faster than writing out a prescription on paper. So I, I tend to dread writing it out on paper now because it's so time consuming. Um, yes, you can see patients in groups via telehealth. And so after you join the session, you can give that, because each, each session has a unique URL to it. And so when you get that, um, on the day of the appointment, you can get that URL and open up the encounter and then send that, um, you can send that URL to other attendees who need to join. And if a patient is in a different time zone than the practitioner, will the will Charm have a way to deal with the conversion of time zones on, on the scheduler? That's, <laughs> that's something I've been working with the engineers to, to help fix. Yeah. 
So you'll probably receive an update on that soon. Yeah, yeah, that's the great, I really, so you can work with a company that probably won't incorporate your feedback or you can work with a company like Charm where you can meet all of the engineers and they incorporate your feedback and they roll it out in the next update. And so that, that's the thing you can't really, uh, can't really get with those large companies. That's what I hear about people who've been to Charm a lot several years in a row. If you have, you know, things that you want to be addressed, you kind of share them with their developers, meet with them. And it was, it's just great to hear like the next year rolls around and they're like, okay, all these things that you guys asked for, you know, have been rolled out and it's fixed. So it's just really a great way to connect with us. And we're a small enough company that we can, you know, kind of listen to you. So. Exactly. Yeah. I'm looking to see if there are any other questions here. What kind of camera do you use? Oh, I have the, the Logitech C922. And that's also, um, I describe it in a little bit more detail about like the features of why I like that in the YouTube video. Yeah. And then are you saying payers and insurers actually pay for telehealth services? That's, it's pretty variable. Um, and unless you're in a state, one of like the seven states that actually mandate parity with in-person visits, then um, all bets are off. Uh, it could be if the, so the, in a state like Illinois, for example, where I'm at, and they are not required to reimburse, but they, there are a number of payers out there who do reimburse, but they're not required to. And so United Healthcare probably being at the, the top of the, of being most friendly in reimbursement. And then, I don't know, maybe, which one do I never get help with? So like Aetna probably, it's probably like only 20, 10% of people's plans with Aetna are going to reimburse for telehealth. So. Um, there's a question here regarding um, where is Charmalot this year? This year it's going to be in California, right here in our headquarters. So you will, it will be in Pleasanton, California. So you have three different airports to fly into if you're coming from out of state or out of town. Um, there's also, um, is the add-on for electronic prescribing as simple as the telehealth add-on? So you need to, um, for just regular non-controlled substances, it is that simple. Uh, you have to, there is a little bit of correspondence with Charm just to activate it on the back end. And if it is, if you were trying to prescribe controlled substances, then which require an in-person visit, but I have some in-person visits that I do just on a case-by-case -case basis. So I do have the controlled substance aspect, and then there's, you have to get a notarized document signed through a, uh, one of the third-party companies that, that allows for the two-factor authentication to occur when you're sending a controlled substance. So that's one of the requirements for that. So it's a couple extra steps. Um, if you want to do controlled substances, but yes, it is that easy as just activating it for um, regular prescriptions. I see one question here. How do you maintain office space for in-person visits when required for controlled substances? Oh, there's a number of ways. I mean, I actually work in person at a substance treatment facility. And so I have office space there. And there's also a number of uh, co-working spaces that you can rent by the hour um, liquid space, um, Regis, uh, there's a, probably 10 other, we work, there's 10 other companies where you can rent office space by the hour. And so that's, that's how I do it. And a lot of, I actually come across a lot of psychologists and therapists who are using those spaces too. <laughs> so. Um, Peggy has a question here. Is it possible to take an image from the zoom meeting for, uh, for example, a surgical incision line? Oh, like a still image for any sort of yeah. Um, I not that I know of. I would recommend probably just sending. You can do a file. I believe you can do a file transfer as a. Maybe you can't. But in in so if somebody wants to send me, for example, an image. Somebody sent me a photo of their dog. A patient sent me a photo of their dog on a walk the other day. They sent it as an attachment and a message in Charm. And so you can send PDFs, JPEGs, what have you, uh, through Charm messages as an attachment. Um, I don't, you can do a recording, like say for example, um, I don't know a way of a snapping a still image though. I actually never, yeah. never tried. Yeah, I'm not sure how to do that within Zoom as well. I'm, I don't see an option to actually just snap. 
at least not within Zoom. Telehealth visit recording saved in the patient's file? No, it's not. Uh, Peggy Stein uh, has given an answer that PHR image will work. So maybe sending it through the PHR. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the recording of this, um, well, someone's asked a question about tele the telehealth visit itself. Um, is it saved in the patient's file? No. Um, there's a there's a way to do a recording, and I've come across some um, practices that encourage and allow that as a way for individuals to get more out of the session because they I, they can't retain all of the information that you talk about in a session and want to go back and review it. Um, and I know there's a way to do a recording, but I think it saves locally, or if you have a Zoom account, it would save onto your cloud, but you need to have a, a paid subscription and it would save to your cloud. Um, but there's a way to save it locally, and that's kind of how I actually did my some of my um, my YouTube videos. I just did, I clicked record and it saved locally. Great. Yeah. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Bassi. Thank you so much, all of our attendees for uh, attending this uh, webinar. Um, I see a lot of, um, you know, many of you have benefited from this webinar and you're, um, and I'm happy about that. If there's anything in the future that you'd like to see, please feel free to email me and, and let me know. Um, we obviously wanna cater to your interests um, and, and make this as productive for you as possible. So thank you so much. Thank you all for your questions. Thank you yeah. for your interaction. Thank you for being here. Um, thank you, Dr. Bassi, once again. Thanks, Sean, the and Justin for answering the questions on the side. Yeah. Um, you guys all have Pleasure. a great day. Yeah, uh, we too. have webinars coming up every month, so look out in your inbox. Um, Bluefin, Scantron webinars. We're going to have um, some, some, a great lineup uh, this year with various topics, so keep your eyes open in your inbox, and, you'll, and, and hopefully you'll join us then as well.